Okay, well, welcome. Um, I'd first like to welcome you to Planet Earth. This is uh, where we are, over on this side. Um, we've gotten an unprecedented view of what our globe looks like in recent years with satellite imagery and a little help from Google Earth assembling it all together. But satellites can't penetrate through the ocean any more than you can see through the ocean when you're flying in a plane. And so the two-thirds of the Earth that are covered by at least 200 meters of water and the average depth of the ocean, which is over two miles, is very difficult to see. But hopefully you'll come along with me and come out to sea and go on a dive and take a look and see what's out there. First thing we need to do is get on a large ship. This is the research vessel Atlantis, and this is the first time that I saw her. Um, this is off the coast of Costa Rica, and we were going to one of my favorite sites, which I'll show you in just a minute. So we get on the ship, we go through a whole bunch of safety briefings, we have to try on these ridiculous Gumby suits, which, um, <laughs> immersion suits, sorry, which would save your life if there was a man overboard, if there was an abandoned ship drill, something like that. It's also a really good opportunity to make fun of your undergrads before they turn into the next generation of researchers and really teach you something about the science. Um, so once we've done that, we get to go out to sea. We roll out the sub. This is, the, um, this is Alvin, the man submersible, probably the most famous one in the world. And then we climb up that ladder and we get ready to get inside. You have to take off your shoes. They ask you to take a shower and wear clean socks because you're sealed in here from the outside for eight hours with two other people in a six foot diameter sphere. Now, if you're a little bit claustrophobic, like I am, you have to take a minute now and calm yourself down, relax, don't freak out, because they're gonna kick you out of the sub and they're never gonna let you back in. And so if this is a dream of yours, as it was mine the first time I did this, you really just have to relax and take a minute to calm down. But then they lift you up and they drop you off the back of the ship you float away, they motor away a little bit, they keep tabs on you so they know where you are, and then you bob around on the surface. You might feel a little bit seasick at this moment. I'm luckily don't get seasick, um, but if you do, you might feel it, but then you end up underwater. The surface goes away, You're, the sub is entirely weightless, and you start to descend down to the bottom of the ocean quietly. Everything gets darker and darker and darker, until finally you reach the floor of the ocean. And this is usually what you would see. This is the most common habitat on Earth. All of that vast expanse of the deep sea, you go down to the bottom, you're so excited, and you see mud. <laughs> That's the end of our dive. Thanks for coming. That's it. <clears throat> no, no, no. We can do a little bit better than that. Actually, there's a surprising diversity of organisms that live in this mud. In between grains of sand, burrowing through the mud, it ha hosts a wide array of organisms, a really surprising diversity. But let's pick something a little bit more interesting. There are lots of places for us to explore. You see the seams of the baseball running all over Earth, the spreading centers between the continental plates. Those are really interesting places. Um, so we're gonna focus in on one very near where scientists first went to these sites. Um, they figured that they would be seeing this axial valley in between two continental plates that are spreading apart. They might get to see um, some active lava flows. They might be able to see a volcano at the bottom of the ocean, which is really what they were looking for. This is an area that's really well mapped um, from the research vessels that can use sound waves to map the ocean floor. So this one we have a better picture, but only about 5% of the Earth is mapped to that degree surprisingly small amount, and most of that's in shallow water. This is one of the ones that we know pretty well. So those geologists went down. They didn't even bring a biologist with them on this first cruise in 1979 to go see these places. They went down there, they were looking for lava flows. They thought if they really got lucky, they would see this, and this is a, a black smoker. This is a hydrothermal vent where you have four to, uh, three to 400 degree Celsius water pouring out of there. It's still liquid water because of the immense pressures. We're at 2,500 meters right now, depth. About a mile and a half, almost two miles down. So there's immense pressure. So this really hot water is actually still a liquid. And it contains a ton of different types of dissolved minerals in there. Sulfides are really important, iron minerals. Anyway, 
they were looking for this when they looked out the front window of Alvin, which is where this picture is shot from. They were confronted with biology, and these geologists had no idea what they were doing anymore. You can see the shimmering water, you can see the hot water, but there are these little red worms sitting there. When they went a little further away, those worms are not always very little. These are about six feet long. These are giant tube worms. They have no digestive tract as adults. They have no mouth, they have no gut. They're entirely making a living off of these sacs of bacteria that fill their bodies. They transport oxygen and hydrogen sulfide that's coming out of these volcanic vents. They transport it, the, the animals, the worms, transport it to the bacteria. The bacteria oxidize the sulfide, release a whole bunch of chemical energy which they use to make sugars, analogous to photosynthesis, except using chemical energy. This is chemosynthesis. This drives this entire ecosystem. It's shut off from the sun. It has no connection to the surface whatsoever. All of the organisms that live down here are living off of this chemical energy. The tube worms, the crabs, the fish, all of these organisms entirely shut off from the sun. What this taught us back when we figured, took a few years for the biologists to come along and put this together, but what this taught us is that we should be looking for these places in other, these ecosystems in other places as well. So let's leave the spreading center. Let's come a little bit closer to home, which is where most of my research has been in the Gulf of Mexico. And here, this is an area where we have very active oil and gas production, as we all know, and oil and gas seepage, natural seeps, coming up through the sediments and fueling the same types of ecosystems. These are tube worms that are found in the Gulf of Mexico. The close cousin of the hydrothermal vent worms, living off of chemical energy, shut off from the sun, but the chemical energy is coming from bacteria that are burning hydrocarbons. They're oxidizing oil and gas, and when they oxidize it using something other than oxygen, but using other chemicals that contain sulfur, they release hydrogen sulfide. And that's where the hydrogen sulfide's coming from that fuels these systems. The other thing that, the, the other byproduct of that, when you're at the bottom of the ocean, is not carbon dioxide, but bicarbonate, which is very similar to carbon dioxide, except the carbonate in the bicarbonate will supersaturate and it will precipitate out and it forms rocks. So you get two worms forming these large fields and you get rocks right next to them. And when that oil and gas seepage has happened for long enough, those rocks begin to accumulate in there and finally the oil and gas seepage stops. They get sealed off, they get paved over. And then you get this Dr. Seussian landscape that starts to form on top of these rocks and that includes these sea whips, these sea fans, all of these corals that start to come in. And the corals are sitting down there and they are tied to the surface. They don't have the symbionts that the tube worms have. They don't even have the symbionts that shallow water corals have. They're feeding off of plankton that's coming down from the surface after it's died and slowly sinking. Small crustaceans, small shrimp that are then feeding off of that plankton. But they create a habitat for a wide variety of other organisms as well. Um, <clears throat> those crabs, those anemones, and also um, some fish, some other communities. They create these extensive reef structures that go on for hundreds of meters, in some case a few kilometers, down in the deep sea. There's no light directly fueling these systems like there are in shallow water, but there's enough production coming down from the surface so they can create these structures. And these structures can be incredibly old. They can be this one that we're looking at right now is over 130,000 years old. Coral growth, the skeleton growing, all that production coming down from the surface, all that carbon that comes down, floats down, the corals consume it, they grow, and they create their carbonate skeletons. So they're sequestering that carbon. And forming this huge reef supports a wide variety of creatures like this very large shark swimming around looking for those fish that you were just looking at. And the ecosystem that has been here for hundreds of thousands of years in this one location. We just found this in 2009. We're exploring the deep sea to try and find these. Now remember that these corals originally settled on a little rock and that rock came from the oxidation of oil and gas by bacteria. 
we find these sites the same way that oil companies go to look for oil reserves. And so when we're out launching a submersible over one of these coral reefs, we might be right next to an oil rig. In fact, it's hard to get out of sight of an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. There are so many in deep water these days. Our work and the, the number of reefs that we've discovered in the deep Gulf of Mexico has actually uh, resulted in the US government doubling the standoff distance that rigs are allowed to get within these ecosystems, within these coral ecosystems and within the hydrocarbon seep ecosystems that I was showing you. So this exploration in the deep sea has actually led to further conservation efforts down there. Now that's great um, for moving an oil rig slightly further away. We never expected that this would happen. Um, today is the third anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon disaster, this massive oil spill. We know because we had been exploring the deep sea in the Gulf of Mexico, what those deep sea ecosystems were supposed to look like. And so when we went down there and we saw them after the spill, we could tell when we were looking at a damaged coral. We could tell when we zoomed in and we saw a coral covered in this substance that that was oil. And we could take samples, we could directly link it back to the oil spill and we know where the damage from the oil spill occurred, even in the deep sea but only because we had been down there, only because we had been exploring, only because we had seen these ecosystems before. And this isn't the only impact that man is having, even in the far reaches of the deep sea. In the upper left there, that's the equipment that they're going to be bringing down to the hydrothermal vents to begin strip mining them. All those minerals that are dissolved in that water, that super hot water that's coming out, they're taking that equipment down there and they're gonna begin mining for all of those, bringing them back up, all those precious metals, all those rare earth elements. And the bottom left, that's the, the amount of man-made CO2 that's been absorbed by the oceans. And the red are the darker colors. That's not only heating up the atmosphere, but turning the oceans acidic, which is going to affect the corals being able to lay down those skeletons and sequester that carbon in the deep sea. In the bottom right is a fishing trawl of orange ruffy that was taken over one of those coral reefs that I showed you, but in the South Pacific. These things are worldwide, they're all over the place. And yes, um, most of the deep sea might be covered in mud, but there are a lot of these special ecosystems that are down there that we're only beginning to understand. And if we go forth with all of these things blindly, this is what our deep sea is gonna look like. We're gonna have strip mine, hydrothermal vents, oil covered corals, that lonely crab sitting there with no coral reef to be sitting on and the potential acidification of our oceans. But if we concentrate on exploration, if we go down and find these places and we know how to do it, we can keep them. This is what the deep sea should look like. This is what these ecosystems should look like. We haven't yet impacted the deep sea to a great extent. We have the opportunity to take these ecosystems that haven't really yet been touched by man and there aren't very many of them left but to take them and preserve them, figure out where they are, make the discoveries that we've made only in the last few years, map them out, understand them, understand what makes them tick, what their function in the larger global ecosystem is, and preserve them. And make sure we don't drop an oil rig on top of them. Make sure we don't strip mine on top of all of those tube worms, all of the other impacts that we ha we're having today and that we may have in the future that we haven't even thought of yet. We can do this, this really isn't that hard. It takes a little bit of effort, but we know how to do it. It takes a little bit of forethought, which is something that sometimes we're a bit short on, um, but we can do this. We have the, ca the capacity to preserve these pristine environments before we've had an impact. So let's climb back into our submarine. They don't actually let you out, but let's get back in anyway. Let's set back off for the surface, hope that ship is still keeping track of us. They can come by and pick us up and lift us out of water. And has this been your first dive? Yes. Everyone, yes? Your reward for going down the first time is getting an ice cold bucket of water dumped over your head. Uh, this was my graduate student's first dive, so I got the honors of dumping the bucket on her. And then your reward for taking someone on their first dive is an icy hug to share the excitement of being down in the deep sea for the first time. So I hope that you enjoyed your trip and I hope you have a chance to do it again.